welcome to my video. So today I'm going to be discussing the May June 2019 question paper 11 for physics. And the question paper is one hour 15 minutes long. And I'm going to going uh, to be going through how this question was worked out so that you can be able to understand how to work this out. And if you like access to the question paper, I've linked it down in the comment section below. And if you have a particular question that you want to target, I'd highly, highly encourage you that you use my timestamps to get to that particular question. Okay, so let's begin. The first question, we've been asked which unit can be expressed in base quantities as kg m squared s to the power of negative 2. And if you look at the first one, which is the Joule, right? Um, we know for the Joule, um, work done is going to be the force multiplied by the distance, okay? So the force is going to be kg m s to the power of negative 2 multiplied by the distance, which is going to be m. That's going to give you a force of kg m squared s to the power of negative 2. So the answer is going to be... Um, to be a it can't be b because that's kg m um ms to the power of uh um kg ms to the power of negative uh two pascal is kg m to the power of negative one s to the power of negative two same as the what kg m squared s to the power of negative three so the answer is a move on question two we've been given that the luminosity or l of a star is given by that formula and we've been asked to find the si base units of l what do we know we know that um l is going to be equivalent to r has the units of m squared multiplied by sigma is a constant with w okay w is going to be kg m squared s to the power of negative three okay multiplied by m to the power of negative two multiplied by k to the power of negative four but t squared t to the power of four is going to be k to the power of four so these two are going to cancel out okay these two are going to cancel out and we're going to be left with kg m squared s to the power of negative 3 and the answer is going to be c um moving on to question number three moving on to question number three i'm given a particle that is a velocity vw or just vv we've been asked to give expressions for the magnitude so moving to question three we've been given a particle with velocity v and we've been asked to um to give us the magnitude of v and the angle okay so moving on to question number three, we've been given a particle that is velocity v at an angle theta to the horizontal, and we've been asked to find the magnitude of the angle v and the angle theta. What do we know? We know that tan theta, okay, we know that tan theta is equivalent to the opposite divided by the adjacent, okay? So tan theta is going to be, what is your opposite? Vv, okay, and your adjacent, vh, okay? And we want to find the value of theta. So theta is going to be actan of v uh vv okay actan of vv um divided by vh right so theta is going to be that and the magnitude of the resultant force v is going to be the square root of um so you're going to take the angle that you have which is that the two components that you have which is be vv squared plus vh squared so the answer is going to be um to be b so it's very important for you to be keeping that in mind that you have different components and you have different things that constitutes um, what you're calculating. Move on to question four. We've been given a wave that produces um, sound wave of frequency five, and the waves are detected by a microphone on an oscilloscope. What is the time base setting on the oscilloscope? What do we know? We know that the period, okay, the period is going to be the number of divisions multiplied by the time base setting, okay? So the time base setting is basically going to be the period that you have divided by the number of divisions, right? So what is the period is going to be one divided by five okay so basically if we divide one and five we're going to get 0 0.2 okay and the number of divisions they're going to be one two which are going to be two divisions right divided by two that's going to give you an answer of 0 0.1 right which is going to be the number of divisions that you're going to have out of your answer which answer is going to give you 0 0.1 and the answer is going to be d because 100 100 times 10 to the power of negative three okay so if you have 100 and you say times 10 to the power of negative 3, you're going to get 0, 0.1 seconds per division. Okay, so the answer is going to be D. Move on to question 5. And we draw that the speed shown when a car speedometer is proportional to the rate of the rotation um, of the tires. Okay, so the variation of the diameter of a tire as it weighs introduces an error in the speed shown on the speedometer. Okay, so very important. A car has new tires of diameter 600 millimeters, okay? So, basically, if you're going to have a tire, it's more going to be like this. Let's draw it, right? So, this is going to be our tire, and it's going to have a diameter of 600, right? So, it's very important for us to be aware of this. So, the diameter of this is going to be 
600 millimeters okay and by wear and tear six millimeters of material is removed from the outer surface okay so we're going to remove six millimeters of material so it's going to be something like this and we have removed six millimeters of material right something like this okay so what is the area that the error that we're going to have um in the diameter well we're going to find what has actually changed because we once had that value now we have six and we also have six that we have lost on that other side so our overall diameter has reduced by 12 okay so the error the delta error in the value of d is going to be six uh 12 okay six plus six divided by 600 why because the diameter is 600 and if if you have removed six millimeters on one side you also want to remove six millimeters on the other side so you're going to remove 12 in total multiplied by a hundred and these two values are supposed to give you um two percent see this is going to give you an answer of two percent but now this is much more smaller imagine you have a car on the road right and this is going to be your wheel now it's going to be much smaller right something like this right it's going to be much smaller what does it mean about the rate of rotation a bigger wheel is going to have a slower rate of rotation we can all agree on that right and a smaller wheel is going to have a larger okay a larger rate of rotation because it's small right it's going to rotate much 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 faster one revolution is going to be very quick one revolution and it's done if you have a particle here it's going to take a long time for you to reach the ground and go back up but the particle here just going to be two minutes then it goes up then it starts over that journey so it's going to have a larger rate of rotation and according to here the speed shown on the speedometer is proportional to the rate of rotation of the tire so if the rate of rotation of the tire is going to increase what does it mean about the speed is going to be too high so the speed is going to be too high by what but by two percent right because because the rate of rotation of the tire is going to increase you have removed a fume layer so you're going to have a higher rate of rotation and the car speedometer reading is also going to be too high very important move on to question six a car travels on a straight road the graph shows the variation of the velocity v of the car with time t for um for six seconds of his journey okay the brakes of the car applied from t is equal to one okay so let's put a marker here and we're also going to put a marker here on this particular side right so we have two sides and how far does the car travel while the brakes are applied what do we know we know that displacement okay we know that displacement is going to be the area underneath the graph the area under which graph right this whole area is going to be equivalent to the displacement that you're going to be seeing okay so if you find the whole area underneath this graph a we can then find the displacement what do we know we know that the displacement d is going to be okay one half a plus b multiplied by h right so we're going to start um we're going to start with half okay half our value of a is going to be um if you look at on that side it's going to be 20 but 21 22 that's going to be 22 plus okay so 22 plus the value on this side is going to be um to be 10 to be going to be 8 okay multiplied by um the height is going to be 3 okay so you're going to get right half plus 8 multiplied by 3 and that's going to give you an answer of 45 meters and the answer is going to be um to be b move on to question 7 and we're given a, a stone that is thrown horizontally from the top of a cliff so let's get this we have a cliff over here right we have a cliff over here and we're throwing a stone from over here so we have a stone which is over here that we're throwing into this cliff and it's supposed to fall into the sea right so it's supposed to fall into the sea sometime later okay which graph shows how the vertical component vv of the stone velocity varies with its horizontal component vh as it moves through the air so here's what's going to happen guys it's going to move down from this point okay it's going to move down to this point and then it's going to reach the water but the vertical velocity is going to remain the same right it's always going to remain the same as it's going to fall right so in a is vh remaining the same it's not because here you have a different value than here so a cannot be a possible answer can b be a possible answer it's not because it's going to keep on varying right which is not true can c be a possible answer it's not because it's going to keep on varying is d a possible answer yes because you have one value of vh but what's happening to vv right vv is going to start at zero here so vv is going to be zero here but it's going to increase right it increases as you fall down why because you have an acceleration which is equivalent to 9.81 as you fall down so vv is going to increase 
and VH is going to remain the same, and your answer is going to be uh, D. Very important. Move on to question eight. Um, okay, talks of electric fields. We don't quite cover, cover electric fields in our syllabus, so we won't be answering question eight. We can move on to question nine. Each diagram illustrates a pair of forces of equal magnitude. Which diagram gives an example of a pair of forces which is described by Newton's third law of motion? Like, this question is very, um, applies a certain principle of you knowing if Newton's third law of motion are really, you no, know, really makes sense to you, right? So, for Newton's third law, okay, what do we do? We need forces that have the same magnitude. Okay, that are opposite in direction. So opposite, right? Opposite in direction. Okay, but so they have the same magnitude. They are opposite in direction. They are of the same type. Okay, they are of the same type. Okay, and they have to act on um on different. Okay, so they have to act on different uh, bodies. Okay, so if you start with A, like I've said, let's look at A. Do they have the same magnitude? They do. Are the opposite in direction? They are, right? One is forward, one is backwards. Are they of the same type? They're not. Because one is a driving force and the other is a resistive force. Are they acting on different bodies? They're not. So A is wrong on that regard. Moving on to C. Are they of the same magnitude? They are. One is up, one is down. Are they opposite in direction? They are. Are they of the same type? They're not. A weight and support force are not the same. Do they act on different bodies? They do not. They're both acting on a box. So C is wrong because they have to act on the on different bodies, be of the same type, opposite in direction, but having the same magnitude. If we move to D, is the lift force equal to the weight acting down? It is. So they're opposite in direction, have the same magnitude. But are they of the same type? They're not, right? The lift force is actually a force that's acting up, right? Because of something going on here, and the weight is not the same. It's not the same type as a lift force, right? So it can't be the same. And are they acting on different bodies? They're not. They're all acting on an aeroplane. So D is going to be wrong. But let's move to B. Is B correct, right? Let's go again. MOSA, which is my abbreviation, okay? So are they all the same magnitude? They are, right? Because these two forces are equal. The force that the moon exerts on the earth is going to be equal to the force that the earth exerts on the moon. Are they opposite in direction? They are. One is acting towards the moon, the other towards the earth. Are they of the same type? They're both gravitational forces, which is quite correct. Do they act on different bodies? One acts on the Earth, the other on the Moon, which is correct. So the answer is going to be B. Very important. Okay, question 10. A stone is dropped from a tall building. Air resistance is significant. Okay, very important for you to take note of that. The variation of the distance fallen with time is shown by the dashed line, like which is this line, okay? A second stone with the same dimension but a smaller mass is dropped from the same building. Okay, so we have a building over there and we're going to drop a stone, okay? But we're going to take a smaller mass, that's going to fall down. But the weight, however, because it's a smaller mass, the weight, okay, minus the air resistance, right? Minus the air resistance, okay? For question 10, minus the air resistance is going to be equivalent to your mass multiplied by your acceleration. So this weight, however, is going to decrease because it is a smaller mass. If this weight decreases, it means that the resultant force is also going to decrease. Hence, the acceleration is also going to be smaller. So the acceleration for the second stone is going to be smaller. But since it's dropped from rest at a tall building, I know that the gradient of a distance time graph is going to be my velocity. So the initial velocity is going to be zero. And we can eliminate A because if you look at A, the initial velocity is not zero. So A is out. And if you look at B, it is zero because it is curving here. So the initial velocity is zero. But the problem that we have with B is that this velocity is going to be higher. Okay, this is a higher terminal velocity, right? Of which it doesn't make sense because if the acceleration is going to be very small for the smaller mass, how is it going to have a higher terminal velocity? It's going to have a very less steep gradient. So it's going to have a very small terminal velocity. So B cannot be correct. So the answer is either C or D, right? Why is D wrong, okay? Or why is C correct, right? Let's go in, uh, let's figure that out. So with C, of course, for both, the terminal velocity is less, right? So the terminal velocity is less than uh, than the first, which is quite correct. But if you look at D, it's not going to be zero. The initial acceleration is not going to be zero. It's quite difficult to see on the screen, but 
if you were to follow d right if you were to follow d like this like this like this and it's going to be a straight line like that there's no way where the acceleration is going to be um like the initial velocity is going to be zero but if you look at c it's more like this right it goes it goes then it sort of curves then it's going to have an initial acceleration which is going to be zero so that's why c is correct because c is going to have a, a, a lower um terminal velocity yes but it's also going to have v which is equal to zero at the beginning but d is not going to have that making c the correct answer very important move on to question 11 a helium atom of mass m collides normally against a wall so that helium mass is going to collide normally against that wall the atom arrives at the wall with speed v then rebounds along its original path assume that the collision is perfectly elastic what is the change in the momentum what do we know we know that the change in momentum okay is going to be your mass multiplied by your change in velocity right but it's going to hit the wall with a certain velocity v and it's going to rebound the wall with a certain velocity negative v because it's in the opposite direction right but you know that for this it's going to be m v minus u right the final velocity minus the initial velocity so if v the final velocity is going to be negative v okay and i have m minus v minus v which is going to be negative 2mv right we're mainly interested in the magnitude of this because directions can really be different right so the answer is going to be d very important move on to question 12 you'll be given a cylindrical iceberg of height h which is floating in water the top of the iceberg is at a height h above the surface of the water the density of ice is rho i and the density of the seawater is rho w what is the height h of the iceberg above the seawater okay what do we know guys um we basically know that the up thrusts okay the up thrust let's start from there the up thrusts um okay the up thrust is going to be rho g times v right so the up thrust of this whole thing is going to be this particular um thing that we're going to be discussing okay but i know that since it's floating it means that and it's just stagnant like that it means that the weight is going to be equal to the up thrust those are the only two forces that are going to be acting on this thing right so the weight therefore is going to be rho okay times g times the value of v okay but how do i find the weight of this particular iceberg right of this iceberg i know that the weight okay because you know that right we know that but okay but i know that density is equivalent to your mass divided by your volume right basically so your mass is going to be the density of your iceberg right multiplied by your volume but for you to get your weight of your iceberg it's going to be the density of the iceberg times the volume of the iceberg times the value of g okay so this is basically what you're going to be uh, to be considering right so we can substitute this whole thing right we can substitute it here so that we can be able to get um something that can make sense something that we, we can work with right so this whole thing we can put it um over there okay so very important so that would mean that the density i times the value of v times the value of g is going to be rho but this is the rho of the sea water with the rho of the sea water times the value of g times the value of v okay but this is not the same value of v right because this is the volume of this part right which is very different from the volume of the whole thing this is the volume only of this whole part okay which is different from the volume of this whole thing so to make that clear okay but v because this is v total and let's just say this is a right this is going to be v a okay to make this clear i'm just going to say v total is going to be the area multiplied by the height right but the height in this case is going to be the big h right so the density i times the area times the big h times the value of g is going to be equivalent to the density of water times g but this one is going to be the area yes but it's going to be h minus that small h right so it's going to be h minus that small h right the value of g are going to cancel out the value of a are going to cancel out and you're going to be left with rho i okay times h is going to be h minus the small h times the density of the water right so the density of i h is equivalent to the density of water h minus the density of water h that particular thing right 
So you put that on the other side, we're left with the density of water H is the density of water, the big H, subtract the density of I, the big H. Okay, so we can then divide, we can then find H, which is going to be the density, which is rho W, okay, then which is just going to be, if we divide this, right, we're going to be left basically with uh, rho W on both sides, right, to rho W, um, Okay, so if we divide both sides, so let's divide it. So we're going to have rho w minus h minus rho i, okay, divided by h, right? So multiplied here, okay, so it's multiplied by h, right? And we're going to divide throughout by rho w, by rho w, okay? So these two cancel out. So my h, okay, my h um, is going to be equivalent to h minus rho i over rho w times h. Then I can factor out H, I'll be left with 1 minus rho I over rho W, right? So it's H, 1 minus rho I over rho W, and your answer is going to be um, A. That was a bit complicated, but you have to just understand that after is equivalent to the weight, then you try to equate it, but this is the volume total, which is A times your value of H, then you can find the volume that is contributing to the arthros, then you get your answer as A. Move on to question 13, what is the torque of the couple? So we talk of a couple, basically, is what product of one of the forces multiplied by the distance between the two forces. So it's going to be F multiplied by, but the distance is going to be 2D. So you're going to get your torque as 2FD, which is going to be our C. But for question 14, a crane uses a counterweight to stop it from toppling over when lifting a load. The counterweight has a mass of 5,000. The crane required to lift um, a load of 12,000 kilonewtons and the horizontal distance from the pivot to the load is 17 um, meters. How far from the pivot should the center of the gravity of the counterweight be positioned to keep the crane in equilibrium? What do we need? Okay, so we are, if you consider this as the pivot, we're going to have a weight down here, right? This is going to be clockwise and this is going to be anti-clockwise. If you've ever seen a watch, right, as the watch sweeps in that way, that's clockwise. If it were to move in that direction, that's anti-clockwise. So what's moving in that direction is that thing which is going to be anti-clockwise, right? So basically, we're going to say that the clockwise moments should be equivalent to the anti-clockwise moments, right? What are the clockwise moments? It's 12,000, okay, multiplied by 17. It's going to be your anti-clockwise moments is um, your distance, which is, x, um, which is x. That's what we want to find, okay? X times, but this is 5,000, right? So your weight is going to be 5,000 times 9.81. So we want to find the value of, um, of you know, the value of that distance x that we're going to need to place that counterweight so that we can get a value of um, of x, okay? So the value of x is going to be 12,000 times 17 divided by 5,000 times 9.81. You're going to get a value of x of about 4.15902147. So x is about, you know, 4. Uh, 4.16, right? 4.16 meters, which is going to be uh, to be C. Very important. The prayer, three parallel forces act on an object. As a result of these three forces, the object is in equilibrium. Okay, what must be correct for these forces? Okay, so let's let's look at this. They all act along the same line. How is this correct? How can three forces act along the same line? and still give us an object that's in equilibrium. It doesn't make sense. You have one line here, and you want to like cause these three forces to act along the same line, maybe something like this, maybe something like that again, but it's not going to have the suppose there will be two forces that will be in the same direction and one force in the opposite direction. So they will never be in equilibrium. So A is wrong. They all have the same magnitude, right? That's, that's a bit tricky. If you have three forces with the same magnitude, how can you get zero? Literally, you have three numbers, right? You have three, let's say three in that direction, three in that direction, and three in the direction. How can you ensure that you get an answer of zero? It doesn't make sense. So they all cannot have the correct magnitude, right? They do not all act along the same line, okay? Two forces may act along the same line. For example, that one might, might be a three, and that one might be a three. Three plus three is six. That one might be acting along in a different line, which is going to be a, a six. So you're going to get zero, right? So C is not necessarily correct. But if you look at D, they do not have the same magnitude. That is quite true, right? Because if they all don't have the same magnitude, they can probably add up to zero. So the answer is going to be uh, D. Very important. Okay. 
So question 16, we're given an empty glass beaker that has a mass of 103 grams. When filled with water, this is a very important key term, when filled with water, it is a total mass of 361. Okay, so as you have seen over there, this is our glass, okay, so we're filling it with water, right? Then when you fill it with water, it's going to have a mass, okay, so the total mass is going to be 361. So let's first start for water, right? If you look at water, the mass of water, if the if it's empty, it's going to have 103. Now it's filled with water, it's going to have 361. What is the mass of water? It's going to be 361 minus 103. So it's 361 minus 103. That's going to give you 258 grams. What is the volume of water? The volume of water, we don't quite know, right? But we quite know the density of water, right? Which is going to be 1.00 grams per RDM cubed. Okay. Now we move on to cooking oil, right? We move on to cooking oil. Okay, so when you fill it with cooking oil, like that's cooking oil, um, it's going to have a total mass. So it's now going to be filled with oil, but filled again, the volume has to be the same. If water occupied one specific volume, cooking oil is going to occupy that same volume, right? Basically. So from here, we know that density, okay, is equal to the mass divided by the volume. So the volume is going to be the mass divided by the density, which is going to be, okay, so it's going to be 258 that you have over there, okay, the 258 divided by your density, which is 1.0. So the volume of water is going to be 258 um, cubic. So if we're going to move for oil, the density of oil is what we want to find. The mass of oil is going to be, okay, it's going to be 351, 351 subtract 103, right? So you have 351 you subtract 103 and you're going to get 248 um, grams, right? But the volume is going to be the same because it's also going to be filled with oil, right? It's going to be filled to the same volume that was once occupied by water. So it's going to have the same volume of 258, right? Cubic. So how do you find the density? The density is going to be the mass divided by volume, which is going to be 248 divided by 258. So 248 divided by 258, you're going to get 0. Point, okay, 0. 0.961, which is going to be um, to be A. Very important. Okay, move on. Question 17. You'll be given a rope that is attached to a sledge, and the boy uses the rope to pull the sledge along a horizontal uh, surface with constant velocity. The tension in the rope is 100 newtons, and the rope is held at 30 degrees to the horizontal. Okay. How much work does the boy do on the sledge when he pulls it a distance or five meters along the surface. We know that the work done is going to be equal to the force multiplied by the distance, right? So let's resolve this force, right? If we resolve this force, we're going to get 100 cos 30, basically. So we're going to get 100 cos 30 multiplied by the distance that it's going to move, which is going to be 5, okay? So if you say 100 cos 30 multiplied by 5, we're basically going to get 430 joules, right? Which is going to be um, to be C. Very important. Question 18. The kinetic energy EK of an object of mass M moving at a speed V is given by this equation, which equation is not used in the derivation of this equation. What can we do? Well, let's derive the equation, right? And see which equation we didn't use, right? It's that simple. So we know that V squared is going to be equivalent to U squared plus 2AS. But it's going to start at zero because it's we were considering moving at a value of V. So we can assume that the initial is going to be zero. Okay, so we'll be left with V squared, which is going to be equivalent to 2AS, right? But I know that F is going to be equivalent to my mass multiplied by acceleration because my work done is my force multiplied by my distance, right? So from this expression, from this expression, I know that my acceleration is going to be V squared divided by 2S, as you can see here. So your value of F is going to be your mass times V squared divided by 2S. And we can literally substitute this value over here, right? So our work done, which will be our kinetic energy is going to be F, which is now mv squared divided by 2s, okay, multiplied by the value of s, which is your value of d. These two cancel out. So your ek is going to be half mv squared. We've literally derived that formula. Did we use f is equal to ma? We did. Where? Here, where we used this particular equation. Okay, so A is wrong. Because they're saying, which equation did we not use? Did we use S is equal to VT? We did not. I don't see anywhere where I use S equals to VT here, right? 
So B is the correct answer because C is literally right here, right? So C is wrong and D, work done is equal to four times distance. Here it is again. So D is going to be wrong. So the answer is going to be B. Very important. Okay. A grasshopper of mass 0 0.12 grams jumps vertically. It uses its back legs. So that's our grasshopper. It's going to use its back legs to jump over a time of 0 0.02. It leaves the ground with a velocity of 3 meters per second. What is the average power developed by the legs of the grasshopper? What do we know? We know that power, okay, we know that power is basically the work done, okay, the work done divided by the time that is going to be taken, okay? But the work done is going to be 1 half mv squared, right? So it's going to be 1 half and our mass is going to be 12, right? So it's going to be 0 0.12 but it's going to be one half times 0 0.12 divided by 1000, right? Divided by 1000 multiplied by our velocity, right? Because we have a certain velocity that we're moving at, which is going to be three, okay? But it's going to be three squared, right? Multiplied by three squared. That's going to give us a value of, um, of you know, 5.4 times 10 to the power of negative four joules. Divide by the time taken, which is 0 0.020, right? Divided by 0 0.020. It's going to give us an answer of 0 0.27, right, which is basically uh, going to be C. So 19, the answer is C. Move on to question 20. We'll be given a spring of original length, 100 millimeters, that is compressed by a force, and the graph shows the variation of the compressing force F with the length L um, of the spring. What is the energy stored in the spring when the length is 70 um, millimeters, right? So we're compressing it by force. So you're going to start at 100, and we're going to compress it when the length is now up to 70, right? Because it's going to decrease as we increase the force, it's going to compress. So we basically want to find this energy that is stored. It's going to be the area underneath this graph. How do you find this area? It's the area of a triangle, right? The area of a triangle, and then we're going to say half base multiplied by height is going to be half. The base is going to be, okay, 100 minus 70 times 10 to the power of negative three, and the height is going to be from this one it's going to be um to be six okay so if you say half okay of 30 times 10 to the power of negative three times six um we're going to get 0 0.09 joules 0 0.09 joules and the answer is going to be um a very important Move on question 21 when we're given a 0 0.80 length of steel wire okay and 1.4 meter uh, meter length of brass wire and both of them are joined together the combined wires are suspended from a fixed support and a force of 40 newtons is applied. We're given the Young modulus of steel and we're given the Young modulus of brass. And we've been asked to find the total extension that is possible. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is steel is going to extend, right? So steel is going to extend and then brass is also going to extend. And my total extension is going to be me adding those two extensions, one for steel and one for brass. But what do I know? I know that the Young modulus is going to be the value of what? Of stress divided by strain, okay? Which is going to be your force over area, your extension over your length. So F times L divided by your area times X is going to be your Young modulus E. So for me to find the value of X is going to be F times L divided by E times A. So if I find this for steel, and then I add it up, right? So it's going to be steel, the X for steel plus the steel for brass, right, sorry, the X for brass, right? So the value of the X for brass, and I add this, them up, I'll be able to get um, the value of the total extension that would have happened, right? I hope it makes sense. So the value of our F is going to be 40 because the brass is going to get that same 40. And the steel is also going to get that same 40, right? So it's going to be 40 applied by the length of the steel, okay? So the length of steel is going to be 0 0.80, okay? Applied by 0 0.80, divided by, okay, the Young modulus of steel, which is 2.0, okay, times 10 to the power of 11. Right, so it's 2.0 times 10 to the power of 11 times its cross-sectional area, which is, okay, from this question, it's 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 6. So it's 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 6. And if you compute this, I'm going to get an answer of about 6.66 times 10 to the power of negative 5. Then we're going to add the one for brass, okay? The one for brass. If we do the one for brass, it's going to be the value of 40 multiplied by, for brass is going to be 1.4, okay? 
the steel yam modulus for brass is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the power of 11 okay so it's 40 times 1.4 over 1.0 times 10 to the power of 11 multiplied by um the cross-sectional area which is going to be 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 6 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 6 it's going to give us an answer of about 2.33 times 10 to the power of negative 4. what if we add these two up what answer are we going to get right so if we add these two we're going to get 3 times 10 to the power of negative 4 and our answer for 21 is going to be uh, b very important but on question 22 we're given a transverse wave in a medium that is the wave from that has been shown here the speed of the wave is uh, 200 and 0 0.0 centimeters and a particle uh, of the medium oscillates vertically which graph shows the vertical displacement y against the time which best represents the motion of this particle so basically this is a time against displacement graph and this is a, a distance against displacement graph so what if i found the period then i would compare which one is that same period right because this one these are obviously wrong because they don't even have the shape of like a normal graph that we're used to but for a and b for me to decide i have to look at this the, the period for one is four and the period for the other is 0 0.2 so how do i find the period i know that v is going to be equivalent to f uh, lambda okay so i know that my value of v is going to be equivalent to okay my f from this equation is going to be lambda divided by t because f is goes to okay f is goes to one over t right so my t is going to be my value of lambda divided by v what is my value of lambda in this case my value of lambda is from here to here it's going to be 4 divided by my speed which is going to be 20. so my value of my t is going to be 4 divided by 20 which is going to be 0 0.2 so i need a graph which is 0 0.2 as the period and the answer is going to be um a very important but for question 23 the graph shows the particle of the variation of the displacement of particles with the distance along a transverse wave at an instant in time the wave is shown moving to the right which position along the wave corresponds to a point where particles in the wave are traveling the fastest but upwards so guys i need to explain a particular concept which explains this whole concept of moving upwards or moving downwards so basically for you to determine what is going to be moving up or what is going to be moving down you need to draw what i call the next screenshot of the wave what do i mean by this what i mean is you need to draw the wave at a different time but the easiest way that you can draw this look at this maximum position right every particle wants to also get to that maximum position and depending on the direction of travel if this one is at its maximum the next particle is also going to be at its maximum right so what's going to happen is the maximum here is going to move here okay so it's going to move to this particular position then that is also going to go to that maximum that is also going to go to that maximum that is also going to go to that maximum okay sorry let's let's draw that again okay so it's going to be like this so this to the maximum then it goes down to the maximum that something like this right so we can extend this a little bit down okay so basically this is going to be the next screenshot if i'm asked to draw again another waveform it will be something like this right another one will be something like this you just keep on moving them forward and forward and forward and forward right and how do i know which one is moving fastest so we have two components here the word fastest and the word upwards and we have to be able to decide which of these two is correct and which of these two is wrong right so fastest requires something that is at equilibrium why because it's going, if it's going to move up and down right as a particle let's assume this is my equilibrium position right let's let's take for example a pendulum right a pendulum is going to move to this displacement right but it, as it arrives here the value of its v is going to be zero because it's going to have its maximum gravitational potential energy but it's going to have the highest velocity at its equilibrium point right so it's it's equilibrium point that's where it's going to have the highest value of the velocity right so get this we need particles that are at equilibrium to even consider them as having the fastest speed so basically we need to consider a or we need to consider c so b and d are obviously going to be wrong and from a and b as you can see which one of these two is moving up right you can easily see that it's a that's going to be moving up why because c is going to be moving down 
Why? Because I've drawn the next screenshot of the wave. And that has helped me to decide if the answer is going to be A or the answer is going to be C. So from this question, our answer is going to be A. Very important. And for question 24, I mean, even a long tube that is filled with water and that is a tape fitted at its base, right? So a loud sound is heard at intervals as the water runs out of the tape. The change in water level between the louder sound is 32 centimeters. What does this mean? It means that for the first loud sound that you're going to hear, you're going to have something like this, okay? Because you're going to have an anti-node at the open, you're going to have a node at the bottom. For the next wave that you're going to hit, uh, uh, listen to, so let's remove some water out, right? So we're going to remove some water, something like this, okay? So for the next one that you're going to uh, that you're going to listen to, okay? What is going to happen? What's going to happen is you're going to form another node that is going to be here. So you're going to have a pattern that is more like this, okay? Like this, something like this, right? Where this is going to be a node and that is going to be a node. And you've been told that the change in water levels between the louder sound, so this is the change in water levels, right? They just call it delta D. That is the change in the water levels. And you've been told that it's going to be 32. But I know that. From a node, okay, from a node to a node, I'm going to have half lambda, right? It's a fact that we know. From a node to a node, it's going to be half lambda. From an antinode to an antinode, it's also going to be half lambda. From a node to a node to another node, it's also going to be lambda. So in this case, I have a node and a node. So half lambda, okay, so half lambda is going to be equivalent to 32. So lambda is going to be equivalent to 32 times 2, which is going to be 64 centimeters and the answer is going to be rc very important okay move on to question 25 we're given a stationary insect that is on the surface of water that creates circular waves with its legs okay so the stationary insect is on the water as you can see and is going to create circular waves with its legs on that water now as the insect moves here which road describes the change in the wave at x caused by the movement of the insect okay so we want to study the movement of this insect right so the insect is not going to change the speed of the wave how is the insect going to change the speed of the wave the speed of the wave is always going to be constant right you can't change the speed of the wave just by moving right so a and c are going to be wrong right so this wave speed is going to stay the same but what about the frequency as you can see over here the wavelength is getting squashed up. The waves are getting squashed, 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 right? But I know that V is going to be F lambda. So F is inversely proportional to lambda, okay? So if they're getting squashed, it means that lambda is going to decrease. What does it mean about your frequency? Your frequency is going to increase. So your answer is going to be um, D. Very important. Move on to question 26. A toy motorboat is moving with constant V and it vibrates up and down on the surface of a pond. This causes the boat to act as a source of circular wave that have a frequency f of 2. The speed of water in the wave is 1.5. Okay, A man is standing at the edge of the pond, and he observes that the waves are from the boat are approaching him with a frequency of 3. The formula for the Doppler effect um, calculations with the sound of the water waves may be used for, uh, for water waves or so. What is the possible value of V? One important thing that you need to understand is it's approaching him. So if it's approaching him, it's going to move directly towards the man. Why? Because it's directly approaching the man. So it would mean that A is wrong because it's moving away from the man. And it would also mean that C is wrong because it's also moving away from the man, right? Very, it's, it's, it's almost like that, right? So the two correct answers are either B or it's going to be D. Right? So you just have to decide which of these two answers is going to be correct. Okay, so from the Doppler effect, we know that F, the observed frequency, is going to be Fs V over, okay, Fs V over V plus or minus Vs. But what's going to de depend is that if you move towards, towards something, you're going to use V minus Vs. But if you move away from something, you're going to use V plus Vs. Those are the two things that you must be keeping in mind. Okay, so we want to find the speed 
of the wave, which is going to be V. Because we've been given the speed of the waves, right, which is 1.5, and we want to find the speed of this motorboat as it's going to be moving. Okay, so how do you find that? So we know that F0, the person is going to hear 3. So we know that F0 is going to be 3, and Fs is going to be 2. The value of V is going to be 1.5, and here the value of V is also going to be 1.5. But we're going to subtract, because it's moving towards the man, right? So we're going to subtract the value of V. That is what we want to find, okay? So if we say 3, 1.5 minus V, that's going to give you a value of 2 times 1.5, okay? So this is going to be 3, which is going to be 1.5 minus V. That's going to give you an answer of 3. We can divide both sides by 3. We're going to be left with 1.5 minus V is going to be equivalent to 1. So V is going to be equivalent to 1.5 minus 1. V is going to be equivalent to 0 0.5 meters per second, right? 0 0.5 meters per second. And the answer is going to be uh, B. Very important. Move on to 27. To progressive waves of uh, frequency 300 hertz, superpose to form a stationary wave in which adjacent nodes are 1.5 meters apart. Like I've said, you have a node here and you have another node here. Okay, so you have a node that is at this point. And you have another node that is also at that point. Okay, so those two nodes, the distance between them is going to be 1.5. Like I've said, from a node to a node, you're going to have 1.5, but that's going to be lambda over 2. So what's going to be your value of lambda? So your value of lambda is going to be 2 times 1.5, which is going to be 3.0 meters, right? But how do I find the speed? I know that V is going to be equivalent to F lambda. So what is your value of F? It's going to be 300. Multiply by the value of um, of lambda, which is going to be 3. So you're going to get a value which is going to be 900, 900 meters per second. Okay? So it's going to be 900 meters per second, which is going to be um, to be D. Very important. Okay, 28. The diagram shows the diffraction of waves, water waves specifically, in a ripple tank as they pass through a gap between two barriers. Which diagram is correct? Right. One thing you need to know, guys. Diffraction does not change, right? Diffraction does not, okay, does not affect lambda. F, V, it doesn't affect those things. It only affects the amplitude, right? The energy. But it doesn't affect lambda, it doesn't affect F, it doesn't affect V. Meaning that the wavelength of your wave should not change before and after. So if you look at this, right, it shouldn't change because look at this. Um, let's analyze, okay, let's analyze um, this, look at this value of lambda, right, this value of lambda, and let's look at this value of lambda, these two are different, right, so A is going to be wrong, because lambda has changed, and the wavelength should never change whenever diffraction is occurring, right, as you can see, as diffraction occurs, no wavelength is going to, um, to be changing, right, so C is also wrong, because this wavelength has gotten bigger after diffraction, it, it, it doesn't make sense, right, so C is going to be wrong, and then we're going to be left with uh, D or B. When comparing these two ones, right, D or B, um, the wavelength is going to be the same, right, like this. It's also going to be the same there, right? The gap is pretty much equal to the wavelength, right? If lambda is approximately equal to the gap D, yeah, you're most probably going to have a maximum, right, maximum diffraction occurring. So you're probably going to have a maximum diffraction occurring. Yeah, so your answer is probably going to be B. The wavelength doesn't change. You're going to have maximum diffraction. For D, the wavelength is way, way smaller than the value of D. Yes, but it doesn't really show the effect of diffraction. Why? Because, again, the wavelength is a bit smaller before and after. So the answer is going to be a B. Very important. Move, Move on. on to question 29. Um, we've been given a double slit experiment that is set up as uh, shown. Okay, so we're given the double slit experiment and fringes are formed um, on the screen. Okay. And um, the distance between successive bright fringes is found to be um, 4 millimeters. Two changes are made to the experiment, and the double slit is replaced by another double slit, which is half the spacing. And the screen is moved to, uh, so that its distance from the double slit is twice as great. Okay, so basically, um, we want to find now the new distance between successive um, bright fringes. Okay, so what do we know? We know that lambda, okay, is going to be equivalent to a x divided by d okay so the value of x is going to be equivalent to d multiplied by lambda divided by the value of a okay 
So the value of x that we're going to get in the first place, 4, is going to be equivalent to d multiplied by lambda divided by a. Okay, so we now want to find x2. Okay, so we want to find x2. But for x2, we're going to have the distance that is twice as great. So we're going to have 2d multiplied by lambda divided by half the spacing. So we're going to have half a over here at the denominator. Okay, so the value of x2 is now going to be 2 times 2, which is 4 d lambda divided by a. But as you can see here, d lambda divided by a is actually going to be equivalent to 4. So the value of x2 is now going to be 4 times 4. That's going to give us an answer of roughly 16 millimeters. So the answer is going to be a d. Very important. Move on to question 30. The interference pattern from a double uh, grating and a double slit are compared. Okay. So using the double, uh, using the diffraction grating, yellow light of the first order is seen at 30 degrees to the normal or to the grating. Okay. The same light produces an interference pattern on a screen at one millimeter. Okay. The slit separation is 500 times greater than the line spacing of the grating. Okay. So we've been asked to find the fringe separation um, on this screen. What do we know? So basically, we know that d sine theta for the diffraction grating, d sine theta is going to be equivalent to n lambda. Okay. But we're going to use yellow light of first order that is seen at 30 degrees to the normal um, of the grating. Okay. The same light now produces interference pattern on a screen one meter from the double slit. Okay. So we want to find the fringe separation. We now, we also know that lambda is going to be equivalent to ax divided by d. Okay. So the value of x is going to be equivalent to lambda times d divided by divided by the value of a okay but what do we have here we have the same light that is produced on an interference fringe on a screen one millimeter from the double slit okay so the screen is going to be one so d is going to be equivalent to one so x is going to be lambda times one meter okay because it's one meter there divided by the value of a but do we have the value of a and the value of lambda so that we can be able to find that value, okay? But we've been told that the slit separation, okay, is 500 times greater than the line spacing um, of, the, of the grating. So if we find the value of d here, our slit separation is going to be 500 times that, okay? So let's go here, right? Let's go here and let's find the value of d. What do we know? We know that d is going to be equivalent to n lambda divided by sine theta, okay? So the value of d is going to be equivalent to the order is going to be the first order. So n is going to be 1 times lambda divided by sine 30. Okay. So this is going to be our value of d. So the value of d is, is therefore going to be lambda divided by sine 30. Right. But the value of a is going to be 500 times that. So if you go here, the value for x is going to be lambda times 1 divided by 500 times. Okay. 500 times. If you take that, that's going to be lambda over three over lambda over sine. Okay, lambda over sine uh, over sine thirty. So the value of x is basically going to be equivalent to lambda divided by. So we have five hundred, and we want to divide side five hundred by sine thirty. Okay, so we're going to get a thousand that is going to be here. Okay, multiplied by lambda. Those two cancel out. So the value of x is basically going to be one over a thousand, right? So basically, that's going to be our value of x, one over a thousand which is going to be given to 0 0.001, right? 0 0.001. And this is actually um, going to be in meters, okay? And that's going to be our value of x. So our fringe separation for number 30 is going to be uh, C, which is 1.0 times 10 to the power of negative 3. The answer is C. Question 31 is a question about electric fields. We don't cover them, so we won't be answering that. Question 32 is also a question on electric fields, and again, we will not be covering that. Move on to question 33. You'll be given a voltmeter that is connected between two points, okay? It's connected between point P and also connected between point Q in an electrical circuit, and it shows a reading of one volt, okay? So which statement is correct? Right. The energy needed to move one electron, let's start with D. The energy needed to move one electron from Q to P is one joule. One problem here. We do not move one electron, right? It doesn't make sense. D is wrong. Why? Because we cannot move one electron, right? It, it doesn't make sense because the energy taken, right, or the time, um, sorry, because the energy needed to move one electron is going to be completely different. We need energy to move one charge, right, plus one charge. That is what we are going to need to move, 
right? So D is going to be wrong. We are not going to move an electron, right? It doesn't take one Joule to move one electron, right? So C again is also wrong because we know that. How do I know this? I know that work done is going to be, work done divided by charge is going to be my vote, right? So the energy, the work done to move plus one charge is going to be one volt, right? So it can't be C or D, right? So the energy needed to move plus one chi, it, it's either going to be A or it's going to be B, right? But the problem is this charge, right? The problem is here, where they're saying charge moves from P to Q, right? We have what you call convectional current, which says that um, current will always move from the positive to the negative, right? But the charge, remember, the charge are actually the charge carriers, which are actually negatively charged, right? The charge carriers are actually negatively charged. So it doesn't make sense for us to say that charge moves from P and it's going to reach Q, right? From P up until Q, it doesn't make sense for us to say that charge is going to move um, in that direction, right? Because P is a point of higher potential than point Q as seen that. This means work needs to be done to move a positive charge from Q to reach P, okay? So that positive charge is going to be repelled by point P, so it has to be pushed towards it, so it's going to be one volt, right? So since this is positively charged, if we have a positive charge, right, it's going to be repelled by that positive charge, so I have to do work to move one plus one a coulomb of charge from Q to P, so the answer is going to be B, right? But the main logic about this was to say, we don't move uh, those charges specifically, but we're going to move electrons, which is going to move from a point of lower potential, Q, to higher potential, and we're going to do work to um, for us to be able to do that. So the answer is going to be B. Move on to question 34. Which graph best represents the variation with current I of the potential uh, difference V of F filament lamp? What do we know, guys? I always say this. Whenever you're given graphs, you're going to need three things. Number one, you're going to need the X's. Okay, number two, you're going to need the area underneath the graph. And number three, you're going to need the gradient. From this case, for, as you can see, I've shown on the diagram the graph for a filament lamp and for a semiconductor diode and for a metallic conductor. And you would appreciate that, okay, um, you would appreciate that the graph for, okay, so if you're going to draw a graph um, for a filament lamp, right, it's going to look something like this right? It's going to look basically something like this, but this is going to be an IV graph, right? So this is going to be I against V, right? But if you're going to draw a V graph, right? If an IV graph is going to look like this, a V graph is going to look something like this, right? So a V graph is going to look a bit different, right? Because if an IV graph has to look like that, a V graph has to look uh, something different. So a V graph is going to look like this, Okay, so we're going to have V here, then we're going to have I here, because you get this, it's going to move like this, and then there's going to have that, this curve, right, which is going to move like this, and then you're going to have this curve, right, so it's going to be something like this, and the only answer that gives us this graph is going to be B, right, most people could have put A, thinking that this is an IV graph, but it's not, right, so read your axis and be very careful when tackling this question, it's very important, okay, move on to question 35, when a battery is connected to a resistor, okay, so when a battery is connected to a resistor, um, the battery gradually becomes warm, right? This causes the internal resistance of the battery to increase whilst its electromotive force stays unchanged. So let's do a diagram, guys, so that you can better understand this. So we have an EMF source, something like this. We have an EMF source, and we're going to have an internal resistor. Let's just say R, right? So it's going to be something like this. Okay, so what's going to happen, guys? We're going to have an external source, right? Let's just say we have something external, which is going to be something like this, right? So basically, the EMF is going to remain unchanged, but the internal resistance is going to increase. So as you can see from here, R increases, right? So the value of R is going to increase, okay? How do the terminal potential difference and the output power change, if any, at all? So we want to study how the output power is going to change and if it's going to change um, at all. Okay, so let's see. The terminal potential difference, right? So the terminal potential difference is what you're going to get, right? So it's going to be, let's let's say we're, com we're comparing this, right? Um, these two points, right? And we are connecting a voltmeter here to measure these two points, right? What's going to happen is R increases, right? The resistor, okay? The resistor is going to take some of the energy, 
because it's going to get warm, right? The resistor is going to take some of the energy. So what's going to happen? The terminal potential, okay, since the resistor is going to say we take a lot of energy, the terminal potential difference, right? The terminal potential difference is going to what? It's going to decrease, right? It's going um, to decrease. Okay, so the terminal PD is going to decrease, meaning that C and D are wrong. We're left with A and B. But what about the output power? Okay, I could say that my output power is going to be here, right? What am I going to measure here? That's going to be my output power. I would say power is going to be V multiplied by I, right? The current that's going to flow through the circuit, or I can then replace this and get P is equal to V squared divided by R. And you know that the value of R, this one is, going not, is not going to change, right? But I've said that the terminal voltage, which is going to be the power that's going to move here, right? The V that are going to register across here is going to be the same as that V, right? Is going to be uh, lower, right? So if this is going to decrease, what does it mean about my output power? It means that my output power, okay, is also, right, going to decrease, right? Is also going to decrease. And the answer is going to be A. So it's going to decrease and the output power is also going to decrease and the answer is going to be R to be A. Move on to question 36. A cell is connected to a resistor of resistance 3. The current in the resistor is 1. A second identical resistor is added in parallel and the current becomes 1.93. What are the EMF E and the internal resistance R of the cell? So what are we going to do, uh, what are we going to do here, guys, is we're going to draw an illustration of this whole uh, question. Okay, so let's start. We're given a cell connected to a resistor of resistance 3. So let's first assume here. We're going to have something like this. This is going to be our cell, okay? And we're going to connect this particular cell, okay? Right? Let's say our resistor R, right? We have something like this. And this is going to be um, our cell, right? We have E that's going to be there, right? Which is E here. And this is going to be our small letter R. So the current that is going to flow here is going to be 1, 1M. One and according to Newton's, Sorry, according to Kirchhoff's, uh, you know, the law of uh, second law, the law of conservation of of, uh, of energy, we're going to say that the value of our E is going to be equivalent to I, which is our current, multiplied by R plus the value of R, right? And that's going to be E. Our I is going to be 1 plus the value of R. So it's multiplied, sorry, the value of R plus the value of the small R, which is going to be 3. So you're going to get E is going to be equivalent to R plus 3. 3, right? And this is going to be your first equation, right? So this is going to be equation 1. Let's go on to the second setup. Let's go on to the second setup. We're going to have this same thing again, right? But what's going to be different this time? What's going to be different is that we're going to connect a second identical resistor. Identical, meaning it has the same resistance, and we're going to connect it in parallel, right? So let's do that. So we're going to connect two things. One is going to be here with still 3, then the other is going to be at the bottom again, still with three. These two are going to go and add up and they are going to connect something like this, right? Again, we're going to have E here. Then we're going to have a small letter R here. And let's apply the same law. The value for E is going to be equivalent to the current is now 1.93, right? It's going to be 1.93, the small letter R plus. But this is going to now be the total resistance, which will be three times three divided by 3 plus 3. Why? Because this is going to be the total um, the total resistance that you're going to have, right? 3 plus 3. So your value of E is going to be equivalent to 1.93 R plus 1.93, okay, 1.93 times 1.5. And this is going to be 2.895, right? And we're going to close this, okay? And this is going to give us the second equation. So What's left is I can solve these two equations simultaneously, right? So from this equation, I know that E is going to be R plus 3. So I can substitute in this equation. I can substitute this value of E. I can substitute it over there, right? So I'm going to have R plus 3 being equivalent to 1.93R plus 2.895, right? And this is going to go there. So 3 minus 2.895, okay? 3 minus... 2 point, okay, 2.895. That's going to give you basically 2.895. That's going to give you about 0 0.105. That's going to be equivalent to 
right minus r which is minus 1 it's going to be 0.93 r so the value of r is going to be 0 0.105 divided by 0 0.93 so 0 0.105 divided by 0 0.93 and you're going to get an answer of about 0 0.1129 0322 and if you go here so this is going to be my value of r so r is going to be equivalent to this what about my value of e what about my value of e my value of e is going to be equivalent to r plus 3 which is 0 0.0.1129032 plus 3 which is going to be about 3.1129 something like that and the answer is going to be rc very important for you uh, to keep that in mind from two equations solve them simultaneously okay so for question 37 right okay so for question 37 i'm given a battery with in uh negligible internal air resistance right okay so for question 37 i'll be given a battery with negligible internal resistance that is connected to three identical resistors right all the resistors have the same resistance so what do i do i love this question because i can just assume anything let's assume that this is going to be one ohm this is going to be one ohm and this is going to be one ohm so i can eliminate these two guys because they're in series and i can just substitute them with one thing when these things are in series you add them up right so i'm going to substitute them with one thing but that thing is going to have two ohms right so my total value of r my total value of r is going to be 2 times 1 divided by 2 plus 1, right? So that's going to be the total resistance that I'm going to be getting from this question. So 2 times 1 divided by 2 plus 1. That's going to give me um, basically an answer of about 0 0.6667, uh, right? Ohm, which is going to be my total ohm that I'm, uh, my total, you know, resistance that I'm going to be getting this in this particular question. And this is my total current. So I can, I can find my value of V. Because I know that V is going to be equivalent to IR, which is going to be 0 0.30 multiplied by 0 0.667. So that answer, okay, that I've just found, multiplied by 0 0.30 is going to give me about 0 0.20 um, volts. So this is actually a 0 0.20 volt supply. But whenever things are in series, this 0 0.2 is going to be the same here. And it's also going to be the same here. Why? Because when electrons divide, they reach this point, they divide. Others go down, others go up. What changes is the number of electrons that are moving down or up, right? They are always going to be less than 0 0.30, meaning the current is going to be less. But the principle is that they're going to carry the same energy. They're just going to go through different routes. They're going to reach there, they're going to divide. Others say, we want to go to, uh, to point A. Others say, we want to go through to point B. They're going to divide. You go up, we go down. Then we divide both to one resi ohm resistor and that two ohm resistor. So it means that for X, what does it mean? It means that for X, um, the value of I, we know that V is going to be equivalent to IR. The value of I is going to be equivalent to V divided by R. So it's going to be the value of V, which is 0 0.20 divided by 1. That's going to give you an answer of about 0 0.20 um, amps. And the answer is going to be C. Again, I'll just recap this. Like I've said, you know that you have two resistors, a 1 ohm resistor. Okay, in the beginning, we had a, a resistor, resistor A. Um, X and we're two resistors at the bottom. Then I say that they all have the same resistance. They're all going to have one ohm. And then I use that to find the total resistance, which is 0 0.67. You could have used any number, to be honest, and you still get the same answer, right? And then I have the total current. And then I multiply the two and I got my total voltage. Then I said, whenever things are in parallel, electrons are going to reach a point, then they're going to decide. Others are going to move up. Others are going to move down. And by doing that, they're going to give some energy to X. And we have the value of R of X because I've assumed it, right? Then I have the value of V. Then I can find the value um, of the current, which is going to be C. Very important. Move on to question 38. We've been given a potentiometer and a fixed resistor that is connected to a 12 volt supply. That is a negligible internal resistance, okay? The fixed resistor and the potentiometer each have a resistance of 20 ohms. The circuit is designed to produce a variable output voltage. What does it mean? It means that the voltage is going to vary because it's going to be a variable output voltage. What is the range of the output voltages? Okay, so guys, I want you to understand one underlying principle, the principle of how things are divided in a circuit. I'm going to give you an example and I hope you're going to relate with that example. Let's give you a, a scenario, right? Um, let's assume you have a bag of sweets, right? You have a bag of sweets that will be over here and you want to donate them to two people, 
let's say you have Rob, who is person A, then you have Rebecca, who is person, maybe person B, right? So you want to divide your, your squids amongst um, Rob and Becca, and then you want to have a criterion. Then you say, I'm going to divide this based on your ages, right? Because Rob is older than, than Becca, Rob is going to get more sweets, right? I've chosen a criterion that because you're older, you're going to get more preference. You're going to get more sweets, right? So I'm going to give Rob more sweets as compared to Becca, right? So it means that the criterion can be different, but people are going to be shared the sweets based on their ages, right? So if I go to these ones, think of the criterion, like I've said, in that case, it was the age. Think of the criterion here being the resistance. The trick is the bigger the resistance that you have, the greater the voltage that you're going to get. So in this case, it's no longer age between Rob and Becca, but it's now going to be the resistance that you have. So let's assume this is Rob, right? Let's assume this is Rob. And let's assume that this is Becca, right? So because Rob has 20 ohms, right? It's more like he has 20 years. And Becca has 20 ohms, more like has 20 years. They're both going to get the same voltage, right? But for the range of output voltages, I can move this potentiometer because the potentiometer can be moved. I can move it from two points. I can move it from this point. Then I can move it to this point. And you can agree that there is nothing here. So you're going to register zero. You're going to start with zero. So C and D are wrong. But it's going to also move up, right? If you're going to move it up to this point, right? So if Rob has 20 years and Becca also has 20, how much is Becca going to catch? How much is this resistor? named Becca going to get, right? So it's going to be the ratio, right? So he has 20 divided by 20 plus 20 times 12, right? Which is going to just give you 20 divided by 40 times 12. That's going to give you six. So the answer is going to be A. Very important. So things are shared with the ratio of the resistance. Since they have the same resistance, that's going to get six. You have 12 suites because Rob and Becca have the same age. Rob gets six, Becca gets six. That's how it works. Because they have the same resistance, the first resistor gets six, the other resistor will get six. Question 39. Which statement uh, about the alpha scattering experiment provides evidence for the existence of the nucleus? It's going to be, okay, so for the alpha scattering experiment, you're going to scatter alpha particles and you're going to detect them when they pass through a gold foil, right? Some are going to be deflected, others are going to be passing back, and others are going to be deflected at very large angles. So the mere fact that a tiny proportion of the particles are deflected through large angles gives us evidence for the alpha scattering experiment. So the answer is going to be A. But for question 40, some particles are a combination of three quarks, which combination of quarks would not result in a particle with a charge of either plus 1.0, which is going to be plus E, okay, or zero, right? We know that an up quark is a charge of plus 2 over 3, a down quark is a charge of negative 1 over 3, a strange is a charge of negative 1 over 3. So let's start with A. An up is going to be 2 over 3 plus negative 1 over 3 plus negative 1 over 3 is going to give you 0. So A is wrong because we've asked which one does not. If you go to B, it's going to be 2 over 3 minus 1 over 3 because strange is negative 1 over 3 minus 1 over 3 and that's going to give you 0. So B is wrong. If we move on to C, if we have an up, it's going to be 2 over 3 plus 2 over 3 minus 1 over 3 is going to give you 1E. So C is going to be wrong. But if you get to D, we're going to have 2 over 3 plus 2 over 3 plus 2 over 3, that's going to be 2E. And that is not 1E or 0. So the answer is going to be uh, D. Very important. So this was the paper. Quite a tricky paper, but I just advise you to read a lot and be able to be comfortable with complex mathematical manipulations. But thank you for watching. And if you like the, the content, please comment, like, and subscribe. And you can access the paper that I've worked on in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.